Walking is an activity in our lives that is increasingly important in regard to our personal health as well as the wider climate change ambitions. Walking also has a civic and a philosophical function. Many centuries ago, Walter Benjamin, a German philosopher, used to use the act of walking as an analytical tool for making social and aesthetic observations. I think we all know that feeling when we can wander and look around, we get a different perception of where we are. Walking also keeps us fit and healthy, and it allows us to take part in civic life. It gives you the opportunity to observe and engage with your surrounding and the other people. Engaging with other people, unfortunately, not so much at the moment, but hopefully very soon we will get back to more natural contact with other people, our communities, and more direct engagement with our surroundings. Personally, I always look forward to events with London Living Streets. I admire their relentless and positive energy to campaigning for better streets and inspire people to walk. The various campaigns, including 20s Plenty, London Walking Networks, Low Traffic Neighbourhoods, they all help us and everyone else in London to live better lives. I think also the inclusive approach needs to be rewarded. Their campaigns have a real focus on making streets safer for all of us, for wheelchair users, elderly people, blind, partially sighted, and children of all ages. At a recent UDG event, um, Catherine Purcell made a very strong argument about the need for lower traffic speeds. Because we know children can't judge speed and distance of oncoming traffic exceeding 20 miles per hour. And if you've missed this talk, it was a very, very kind of inspiring talk. It's still available on Urban Nows. And I think we all hope that these successful initiatives will serve as an inspiration for other towns and cities and other neighborhoods. And not just the outcomes of these initiatives on the ground, but I think also the positive relationships that have been built with the stakeholders and the work that is being undertaken by the local government to transform the experience of using London on foot. And I think a testimony to that positive working relationship is that Will Norman, London's Walking and Cycling Commissioner, is with us today. And before I hand over to David and Will, I want to draw your attention to a couple of events and information that you can find also via the UDG. And together with the ICE, we published a street design standards briefing sheet, which can be used in conversations with highway authorities that might not be as enlightened as TfL or some of the London boroughs. And next Wednesday, we will be looking at future facing car parking and movement strategies, exploring how we can bring some of the qualities that we will hear about today to also the less urban locations in the, in the rest of the country. Personally, I have the pleasure of experiencing the positive outcomes of, of David's work and the promotion of low traffic neighborhoods on a day to day basis. My local kind of neighborhood is being Hackney, which is kind of, I know I'm quite fortunate and actually kind of experienced the positive outcome of many of these initiatives day to day. But I also found that the Central London Walking Network has also already encouraged me to take different routes and find more comfortable routes than those that I've been naturally taking for many, many years. So I think both of those, both of those initiatives are an inspiration for other cities and we now also see developments being planned with low traffic neighborhoods in mind from day one. So it's not only the retrofitting that we are talking about in London, but actually it's influencing the new developments that are coming out of the ground across the country. But I think that is enough from me. I look forward to hear from Will Norman and Emma Griffin later on. But first of all, over to David. Thank you very much, Katja. Um, just to say how great it is to be working again with the Urban Design Group. It brings back uh, memories of Cowcross Street, um, where we've had so many wonderful conferences and events together, and then journeying home through Misty Clerkenwell. Well, one day, perhaps again, we'll return to, uh, to real shows. Um, a special thanks to the uh, Jacqueline Swanson and Robert Huxford at the Urban Design Group 
who essentially are running the whole show. They're the engine room making everything happen. And it's, it's particularly difficult when you have Zooms and all sorts of other difficulties. But thank you. Um, a point about housekeeping. Some of you may have been alarmed to see that this event was going to be followed by a London Living Streets general sort of meeting. I'm delighted to tell you that uh, this would now be happening. We will be finishing at 7.30 and the London Living Streets meeting, general meeting, will be for another evening, date to be announced. Um, our speakers are Will Norman, followed by Emma Griffin, and then we'll have questions. Some of you already sent in questions, uh, but please add us to the chat box. We won't be taking people on the whole speaking um, and taking, putting it in the chat box. Is that right, Robert? Is the chat box the right thing? We'll have many benefits, not least we will have questions and not long speeches from the floor. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Will Norman, um, London's first walking and cycling commissioner, a walking commissioner as well as cycling. We've had an incredibly fruitful relationship at London Living Streets with him. And one of the outputs is this map, which I think you will see on his wall on the, behind him when he starts speaking. Um, our view that it is that his role should be to transform Londoners' streets into a paradise for pedestrians. This is beginning to happen. We've had the TfL street space scheme. And most of all, what... Um, Catcher has referred to the low traffic neighbourhoods, which have been supported by Will and TfL. Quite the most radical changes in my lifetime. We feel in Hackney and Islington almost that we're living in paradise despite COVID and all the grim things it's brought. I'm sure Will requires no introduction, but I would like to mention two things. First of all, there's a link with the Urban Design Group um, that nobody else I think will know. In the audience, I hope, is Tim Farrow, well-known uh, stalwart and, uh, of the Urban Design Group, often to be seen at their conferences. He was the father of modern walking improvements, uh, inventor of the five C's for creating walking routes. The first one begins connected. You can have a guess at the others. Now, I think Will stayed with him for a while as a young man, and it's interesting to think of the effect of their conversations and what that led to Will's interest in walking. The second fact may be better known, which is that Will is an ethnographer, anthropologist, and wrote a PhD on this subject. I very much hope that one day he writes an account of the transport tribes of London, the mores of walking and cycling activists and of cabbies, and perhaps some of the groups in TfL, but that is perhaps more for retirement. Will, we very much look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you, David. Um, I'm not sure that I want to do an ethnography of London cab drivers at the moment. I'm not sure how welcome I would be in a, in all of their uh, in, in, in in their lives right at the moment. Um, but I am going to uh, try and share a screen with you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, the Urban Design Group. Thank you, London Living Streets, for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody and to and to and and to talk about the future. And I do want to talk to the, about the future. In, in in this in in this session, um, I, the, I think the original title, which uh, which one gets, which I saw on one of the pieces of advertising, was um, that we are talking about, um, you know, I think it was the future of walking across the city. And although I've been stuck in my house now for two months, what with isolation and lockdown. I, uh, I still, I, I, I would actually, I've been, one of the few times in my life I would like to walk from Barking and Dagenham to Hounslow, but that isn't the aim of what we're trying to do for walking in, in London. Um, instead of talking about a sort of long distance cross city route, I, I really want to talk to you about the future and why I think walking is so important for the future of, of London. Like many of you, I've been on thousands of calls and conferences listening to people talk about the future city, the smart city. They always seem to involve something electric, whether it's an electric car or a flying taxi or a, I don't know, some monitors or, or big data or artificial intelligence. The robots are going to help. But I, um, I, I'm just going to flick to my next slide. Uh, I, I, I looked at a video that I saw the other day on, on Twitter from a chap called Brian Jones. And I reflected on this street in Isleworth, in, in Hounslow, uh, Church, Church Street uh, down there. 
And in 2017, I worked with the council to put in these simple bollards. And for me, you don't need robots, you don't need drones. The smart city of the future is one in which we can walk and cycle comfortably. And, and this, you know, this, 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 is, this was part of our, our healthy streets work. And, and by putting in this simple change in the street, you can see cars can still access the houses, but the air quality has improved. We've seen a huge uplift in the number of people walking and cycling. Mm. And we were building a street for people. We're building a city for people, a healthy street for people moving forward. And that would be the work that we've been working on for four years. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit, you know, and ev that, that did change everything. For me, overnight, uh, the, the tube revenue fell, budgets were cut, you know, we were looking at emergency services, how we got people into hospitals, providing free bike hire for people, and it radically shifted the priorities within, in London, within London transport. But within the, 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 the terrible, terrible dark cloud of COVID that is still with us, and, and I know that everybody on this call will be associated and, and, and know someone who suffered un, under this terrible disease, but under the, in this dark cloud, there was a silver lining. And the silver lining of the first lockdown was that there was less traffic on the streets. And lo and behold, what happened when there were less traffic on the streets? People started using them. People started walking and cycling. People flocked to those quieter streets and enjoyed them and enjoyed the city without the dangers of the motor car. Another thing happened during that, that lockdown was that the number of people using public transport fell dramatically due to social distancing, but also fear of catching the virus on the on the on the on, on, on the tube or on, on the buses. Now, this is new data coming out of, of TfL, and that new data really just shows after that first lockdown what happened. And one, as I said, the positive news here was that there is a massive increase in walking. You can see at one point, half of London's journeys were being made by walking and cycling. The new data shows that 31% of Londoners were walking to places they used to drive. 57% of Londoners were walking more and walking longer. You know, there is a flip side to this graph though. We also see the increase in car use. And during that first lockdown, just after that first lockdown, my big fear was that the millions of journeys that were being previously made by public transport would suddenly shift to the car. We saw an uplift of people buying secondhand vehicles, for example, and a lot of the patterns that we had worked so hard to sort of change risked moving backwards. And we all know that with more vehicles in London, if a fraction of those journeys that were being made by public transport ended up by car, we'd end up with gridlock and we'd end up with an air quality, an air pollution crisis, which is the very last thing you need in a, in a respiratory disease pandemic. So what we did was rapidly rolled out a series of measures across the city, working with London boroughs uh, to enable more people to choose those safer forms of active transport. In, within in, in a little over six months, there were 22,000 square meters of new pedestrian space on TfL's roads, um, uh, but also over 180 schemes on borough roads of transforming streets like this, pedestrians and high streets from, this is in Hackney, many of you know Broadway Market, what it looked used to look like, transformed so that people could socially distance. People had the space to use those shops and the shops and the businesses benefited from that. We transformed and upgraded over 90 kilometers of, of cycle routes across the city. But I think for me, one of the most exciting growths and the thing that really stands out is the growth of school streets. The school streets, for those of you who don't know, are where we close off the streets around the school at drop off and pick up time. This has a number of benefits. It improves the air quality, uh, it improves, it reduces road danger, and it enables more people to walk, cycle and scoot. Uh, before COVID hit, I think we could basically count the number of school streets on our on, on, on two hands and in main largely focused in one borough. Within six months, we now have, and I've actually lost count of how many there are um, at the moment, but the last count that I had, there are 317 school streets across, across London. And I'll give you an example of how this is changing behavior. There's a school in Enfield where we've seen a 28% fall in car use. We've seen 7% more, more pupils walking to school. We've seen 8% more people cycling and we've seen 10% more people skateboarding or using scooters. These can change kids' lives. And we all know if we change behavior early in life, those things stick. And that's a positive thing that can come out of this for the future. 
We've upgraded over 2,259 different sets of signals across London, giving more time for people to cross those roads. And we've put in 20 of what are the, the green man priority signals that basically always prioritize the, the pedestrian until a car comes along and then it introduces a cycle to do it. So essentially it reverses the idea that you have to push a button for the pedestrian to cross the road. It makes it, it gives the priority to the pedestrian and the road and the cars, the cars have to have to wait. And I think as 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 Katia and David talked about, the transformation we've rolled out over 96 low traffic neighborhoods uh, across across the city that have made an astonishing change to the way thousands and thousands, I think actually 4% of Londoners now live within a low traffic neighborhood, which is astonishing change given where we were, well, a new low traffic neighborhood, sorry. Thankfully, with the vaccine, um, I really hope that we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel of, of, of COVID. But this is not a time to sit back and, and relax, you know, because I think this is an opportunity to look to the future, to reflect on what we've learned over the last 12 months. And how do we build back better? It's a cliche, but it's never been more important than ever before. I want to share a few of the learnings that I've had during this process and how I think it's going to shape where we go forward with walking in, in the city. We learned during this year that even though poll after poll repeatedly showed that the vast majority, there was public support for the vast majority of the measures and the, and the, and the vast majority of people supported them, there was a very loud minority, a sizable minority in places, but a loud minority who were really very much opposed to this. And I think the scale of the backlash you know, was was proportionate to the scale of the change, but it certainly hit people uh, hard, and it certainly rocked a lot of politicians, particularly who haven't been through this journey in the past. It also became very clear, I think, to everybody of the importance of engaging people and consulting people. The measure, the emergency measures that were put in during the height of the COVID crisis last year were done under government legislation and government guidance that was mandating that we don't consult and we roll out at, at speed. I'm very glad that this has now changed because in my view and, and my experience, when you engage communities, when you work with engage communities, the schemes improve and there's greater level of acceptance. So I think that's something that we've learned that, and reinforced why that is so important. Excitingly though, I think this has also shown us how we can do things faster and we can do things cheaper. You know, these planters are not particularly expensive. They're not gold plated, they're not, um, York stone or, or, or amazing granite being shipped in from the from, from Wales. They, they're cheap and cheerful and they're effective. But I also think that we've learned that this is not just is not just enough to plonk down some filters and say a scheme is finished. I'd encourage everybody on this call to read a very useful report published last week by Transport for All called Pave the Way that looked at accessibility and some of the changes that we've been making. And I think one of the things that came across very strongly for me is that you can filter the streets, you can reduce the level of traffic uh, in these areas, but you also need to make sure that these new low traffic areas are accessible for everybody. So we need to be thinking about the quality of the pavement, making sure that there is tactile paving to give people with visual impairments to the ability to understand their new environment. We need to make sure that there are drop curbs to enable people with, uh, with mobility challenges to, to, to move around and ex access the benefits that, uh, that more able Bobby, body people are enjoying. But as we move forward, the, few, the, the challenges of the future remain. We still have an inactivity crisis in London. This isn't a picture of one of my kids during lockdown, but it, but it could well be. You know, I know my children are increasingly spending more time on screens and the level of physical activity is falling across the city, particularly with those groups that need, you know, would benefit from this the most. We've seen during COVID how chronic disease, how inactivity, how being overweight is particularly harmful in terms of this disease. And I think that that is a challenge moving forward. We're about to face an economic crisis like we haven't seen, certainly not in my lifetime. I imagine most people on this, on the, on this cause lifetime. That is incredibly serious for the future of the city. And of course, there's the big one. There is climate change. We are seeing the impacts of climate change. The importance and urgency of moving to zero carbon is, is, is only accelerating. And of course, there's, there's road danger. And road danger, although the numbers of people being killed and seriously injured on our roads, the absolute numbers have fallen during COVID, uh, the, the actual risk and has, has increased because there have been fewer people joining. We've seen an increase in speeding on quieter streets and, and the risk is still there. And I want to dig into this last piece a, a bit further because we all know that for 
to get to enable more people to walk around our city, they need to feel safe. And the the way that our roads have been uh, have been managed and worked on over the past recent decades has made that harder. We did some recent, really recent, uh, recent research that got published a couple of weeks ago uh, from from TfL, and this showed that over the last twelve years we've seen a seventy two percent increase on traffic on local roads. Um, and as a consequence of that higher traffic level, we've sadly seen an increase in the risk. There's been a 38% increase in casualties on these local roads. And that's more than double, almost double, sorry, almost double the amount on, on, on main roads. One of the great advantages of low traffic neighborhoods is that it hasn't just changed behavior, but the new evidence coming from Westminster University is showing that this is actually making it safer. Three to four times safer per trip, made by that be walking, cycling, or by car. And there's no evidence that there is an increase of accidents or, 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 or a negative effect on the boundary roads. So to tackle that challenge in these residential local areas, low traffic neighborhoods have to be part of that approach and our vision zero ambition. Again, coming back to allowing people to feel safe on our roads. We know that speed is a is serious, is, is such a big concern. It's the number one uh, cause of, of, of people being killed and seriously injured on our, on our roads. And it's been brilliant seeing more and more boroughs rolling out 20 miles an hour, TfL rolling out 20 miles an hour in central London, but need, the need to accelerate that elsewhere in the city. And clearly, the enforcement that goes alongside that with speeding is absolutely critical. And I'm really pleased that we are developing a very positive relationship with the Metropolitan Police on that enforcement. We're rolling out more cameras uh, to reduce speeding in the future. And I think that's gonna be an important part. Sadly, some of the old challenges that we've faced for years are, are still there, none, not, not, none least than the, 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 the trucks on our roads. They're disproportionately more dangerous than any other vehicle and responsible for more pedestrian fatalities than any other, uh, than, per kilometre than, than any other vehicle. And one of the reasons is that truck drivers can't see out, you know, from those windows, you can see in the bottom slide with the red, um, with the red thing, actually, that there are big blind spots. You can fit people in front of the truck to the side of the trucks that we've commonly got uh, 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 without being seen. I'm really pleased that in March, the new direct vision standard that is mandating uh, safer trucks or getting those trucks with poor vision to put in cameras and sensors, will come in and that starts, enforcement starts on that in early March. That's a radical shift. And I'm delighted the European Commission have, and Union have adopted the same, uh, introduced that into that le same legislation. So that means that all trucks designed for the European market and Brexit or no Brexit, we buy our trucks from the European market, that will change that essentially will design out the problem for, for, for the future moving forward. So I hope that will save that, uh, lives moving forward and make our streets safer for people walking. Air quality is a key concern. We introduced the ULES, uh, the oops, the ULES in um, uh, in central London, and we saw a ninety, uh, 90 a third, uh, sorry, a seventy, sorry, a third in of the NO two pollution fell in central London after introducing the low, uh, low, the low, low, uh, the, the ultra low emission zone in central London fell by uh, pollution fell by a third. Um, in October, we're expanding that to the north and south circular. And the red dots on this on this diagram show the um, the number of schools that are affected by uh, illegal air um, and how the changes that are being brought in will will transform that um, and reduce the amount of traffic going forward. I'm convinced that we need to continue to tackle road danger at its source and making our streets safer and the design of our junctions and crossings are incredibly important that we need to do this faster and we need to do this better. Um, I'm really pleased that we have been able to work with Living Streets uh, and a call out to Mike Graham on, on the, I don't know if he's on the call, but it working in partnership with, with Living Streets, we have been able to identify crossings that need changes and, and upgrade and I really want that to continue as we move forward. But as we, as the other thing I think we've learned in, 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 in the last 12 months is just how much we value walking. I've never, I, if you told me a year ago that my main social activity would be going for a walk with people, it would replace the pub, it would replace virtually everything. And every day I'm, I'm desperately looking forward to going to walk, a walk with one of my friends or a part of my, part of my family. And as part of that, people have flocked to the wonderful walking routes that have for, have for so long have been undervalued by most, but not by all. 
they've always been valued by the Ramblers. And I've been really pleased to work with the Ramblers on how we can actually improve uh, the uh, the navigation for the London Loop, the Capital Ring, and hopefully this going forward. So big shout out to all the Ramblers volunteers that have been updating that guidance. It's on their website. There's a link from the TFR website. But as we've seen people revalue these walking routes uh, around close to their communities, I think that that's an area where we need to, to invest and we need to uh, resource that. It's not just the long distance walking routes where this has been important. People have flocked to our green spaces. They've been important for our mental health, our social, tackling social isolation, uh, a bit of fresh air, getting out of our house. And I think that one of the lasting things that people will remember from the lockdowns and the COVID period is just how valued those green spaces have been. I think we need to do more to connect those up. London's got a plethora of, of green spaces, small and large. How can we create walking routes between these parks? And how can we do more to join communities, all the communities to, their, to the green spaces and the resources that exist in their areas? And that needs to not just be for um, people able-bodied. You know, when I've walked along so these things, friends of mine have got mobility issues or pushing a buggy. Some of the paths, some of the pavements are just not up to scratch. And we need to make sure that these wonderful resources are open to everybody. It's not just the parks, I think, that we need to make connected. Connecting communities to their high streets has been the other shift that, you know, the value of those local high streets is absolutely critical, critical, has been critical in the, last, in the last 12 months. And making sure that those people, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods play a huge part in this, but the connecting communities to their local high streets and town, town centres is not just good for people's health, but it's also good for those businesses. And we will need that economic regeneration of the high street as this comes out. We know that people walk walking and cycling spend more in their local shops and and that has got to be a key part of the strategy move moving forward it's also good for people's mental health they bump into each other walkable neighborhoods tackle social isolation and as we come out of an isolated period never before will it be more urgent to to get out and live our lives on the streets meeting our neighbors again spending time together socially so to conclude I think our Healthy Streets and Vision Zero approach that we've been working on for four years has been the right approach. I think the work that was done from 2016 up until the time start of the crisis in, in March was absolutely astonishing, not just for what it delivered, but it allowed us, equipped London with the resource, the capacity, the expertise, the communities to deliver the change in a time of emergency that has not been bettered by any other city in the world. Yeah. We've, our healthy streets approach was working, but as I've said, it's never been more urgent for us to continue with this. The challenges that we face are more, more urgent now than they ever have been, whether that's the health crisis, the economic crisis or the climate crisis. So we're gonna have to do more and we're gonna have to do it faster. But because of the emergency, because of the economic crisis, we're gonna have to do it for cheaper. Now the street space and the last year of the COVID crisis shows that that is possible. 12 months ago, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, but it does show that change is possible and it's possible to do this rapidly and differently within London. Um, and I think the, I want to end with a sort of final, my three ingredients of how we, how we make this happen and, and why it's so important. We need the political leadership. We need the political will to do this. We have this in the mayor. It's not there in every borough, but the political will is there. We need the technical expertise from the people who design the streets to design the changes. And as I said, throughout the Healthy Streets Programme and all the work we've done, we've got that. And it's been, they've been able to deliver up until now. We need to continue with and resource them to continue to do it. But the third, and I think the most important factor, is that we need the campaigning communities to continue to demand this and continue to support those measures, to have those conversations around schools, around the shops, saying, isn't this great? We need more of this. Those letters to councillors, the letters to the MPs, all of that is what has made this happen. And one of the things that's happened in COVID is that a new generation of campaigners have emerged because they've seen what is possible. They've seen what they, sort of the streets that they would like. They like it and they've been doing it. So for me, the lasting legacy that equips us to build that city of the future that we need has been this new generation of campaigners, this, this surge in activism, demanding these changes, tied in with the other crises, with the climate change and air pollution, all of that means that 
the changes and the, and the, and the, and the needs, I, I believe this is all possible to do more, to do it faster and to do it cheaper. So I'd like to finish with a very, very sincere thank you for everybody who's been campaigning and working so hard to, to, to support and deliver this and, and to, 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 to work with, with people in their communities to, to, to make the case for this. I know it isn't easy. You know, I know that it's hard. I know that not everybody shares uh, the, our views and I know that people express that in not always the most civil of tones. Um, I know this, but I get paid to do this. The people who've been working so hard, the majority of people on this call don't get paid to do this. They do it voluntarily. They give up their time and, and, and they're talking to people who live in their neighborhoods to make that, uh, to make that difference. So, I want to say that thank you for everything you've done, but I also have to say thank you, but don't stop. Thank you. Please keep going. We need to continue to do this. There has never been more urgent. We need to build back better for the future. We need to be able to get, reach our, our goals of reaching uh, zero carbon by 2030. We need to make London greener, cleaner, healthier and happier for people moving forward. And only by doing that together can we achieve that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a real inspiration. Absolutely fantastic. Lots and lots of chat. I guess one of the messages coming through is, uh, I'm not fortunate enough to live in Hackney or Islington or Waltham Forest. When are things going to happen to, for me in Wandsworth, etc.? cetera? Um, I want to also add that, um, that we've teamed up with the Ramblers and are creating, looking at creating six new routes into central London from the outskirts and one of which I think will really excite people is the potential for a low traffic neighbourhood route that takes you through car free streets all the way from Smithfield to Walthamstow Church and Orford Road which would be uh, which would be fantastic but thanks so much for that real inspiration and it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Emma Griffin um, I've had the great fortune to work with her for the last two years or so on the Footways Project and other things. And she's the most amazing campaigner and colleague. Um, Will asked to make sure we had a campaigner to speak as well as him. There are many excellent campaigners in London Living Street's ranks, but after a short thought, it was quite clear that Emma was the obvious choice. And I think we can really expect a, a, a radical and challenging vision for, uh, for London's future. Over to you, Emma. Thank you. Oh, anyway, here we go. So as David says, we've made a map, but of course there's more than a map. This is, this is, this is something quite unique, actually, this walking map of London. Um, and I know a lot of you on this call have actually heard about this before, so I am going to go as quickly as I can through what it is. But if you want more, go to our website, footways.london, and there's more there, and the Living, London Living Streets website where there's lots more background. But I'm going to go through quickly. So Footways, our idea was, was that it, there were very few maps, actually, for walking. There's loads of leisure maps, hundreds of them. You can get any sort of book or map you want about leisure walking. But when it comes to actually maps for, for getting from A to B, there is very little available. Um, anywhere let alone in London so we wanted to show that walking actually is quite an easy let's see if I can change the slide quite an easy and quick form of transport especially in somewhere like central London some of these journeys here we measured out as part of the work shows that really a kind of a, a, a walk is rough, only a matter of minutes different from a ride on the public transport or even on taxi if you factor in the waiting time. So the aim was about connecting all the places where people were going and traveling to with walking routes. So it was about utility, A to B walking, everyday walking, what you want to call it. But the big difference was, was that we were doing something different than Google Maps or City Mapper and thinking about the streets that do the connections. And we were thinking about walking the types of street. We were prioritizing interesting, historical, beautiful, alluring, enticing, whatever description you want to say, the streets that draw you down, which City Math Food doesn't currently do. It takes you down the busy, most polluted, the quickest, the quickest routes, because that's how its algorithms work. Whereas we were sort of do, doing routes that weren't that actually even that much longer, but just a lot nicer. And the point is, is that environment matters for walking more than any other form of transport, really. We don't you're not afraid of hitting someone, um, although you should be afraid of being hit actually sometimes on our streets, and let's hope we can improve that. But anyway, 
but you are alive to your environment, to the sounds, the smells, the touch, the feel, the hear, everything. It's the one form of transport where environment really matters. So, so moving on, we made the map and um, volunteers at London in the Streets, David and I, walking with all sorts of different groups, actually. It wasn't just us. We walked with um, councils, councillors, council officers. We walked with business improvement districts, cultural organisations, um, some residents, groups, a whole range of people developing this network. And it took a long time, actually, almost two years, really, fine-tuning and creating this network. We got seed funding from TfL to work with Urban Goods to turn it into a printed map, and we published that last September. Um, and it's been really popular. I and mean, we, we were funded to print 10,000 free copies. Um, I think almost 8,000 in, in between September, September and December, people actually turned up at the bookshops that were open at that stage in central London asking for copies. Um, they weren't giving them out, they were actually requesting them. Um, and that was a very limited marketing sort of spend. We haven't got any marketing spend, but just using social media. 400,000 views of the routes on Google Maps. They are available on Google Maps. You can go and get the routes on your phone by going to footways.london and following the links there. Um, so there's huge demand for it. Um, we're going to get it on OpenStreetMap soon so other app providers can use it. We haven't clearly got the budget to create a, a Footways app for London. Um, that's a massive task. We want existing app providers to use it. And we're hoping the likes of CityMapper will take on board. Go jointly, we're already working with them and they're going to get the routes on their app soon. The kind of pictorial routes and also on the amazing new algorithm that they've got, which is picking out the nicer, the nicer routes between places. And hopefully a second print run in 2021. But please, if you want a copy, they were free, but obviously they're quite hard to get hold of now because all the bookshops, are well, they are doing pick, click and collect. So you can click and collect. But if you want a copy, I will send you one as long as you promise to fill in a survey. So please email me and I will send you a free copy. Um, free postage and everything. So anyway, what's next? This is the exciting bit. What's next? Um, this the, the, We're already getting a lot of interest from councils in inner London and beyond and in outer London and from residents and from groups beyond saying, how can we do this where we are? Um, and I think that the greatest potential for walking networks actually comes beyond central London. There's lots more to be done in central London, but beyond that, there's even more, um, especially in outer London. I mean, our high streets post COVID are gonna be more important than ever. We're working more from home. We're visiting the center less probably, probably commuting less in, in the center looking forward. So we're gonna be accessing our, our local high streets um, and we need to be doing this on foot. I mean, the amount of people driving these very, very short distances in out of London, go and check out the TFL's amazing strategic walking analysis. The data in there is astounding. Um, the, walk, the average walk stage across all of London is just 320 metres. That's how far we walk before jumping on a tube or on a bus. If you walk all the way, it's less than a kilometre. There's a huge potential for longer walking journeys and for switching a lot of walking journeys from cars on, uh, to be walked. Um, at one million, I think I've got this one, one million daily trips made by car. I think there's 1.5 million motorised journeys that could potentially be walked in London and a million of those are made in cars massive potential um, but of course these high streets are neglected they need more footfall um, they need better public realm and they just need a huge amount more space for people walking and huge changes in the walking infrastructure so there's a huge task here first of all growing the networks. And if you're interested, and if you live anywhere in London and you're interested in developing networks in your area, please get in touch because we can help you get going with this, get some, we've got a template building for a great way to get these networks to be built and then connecting with all the other places so we can create a kind of London-wide massive network. And we hope this is gonna be a big kind of volunteer effort and bring people together in different groups. I think it's quite exciting. But this isn't just about the networks. This is, and this is again, is even more exciting. This is about, campaigning. I mean, our the aim of this was about creating a navigation tool and it was about raising the profile of walking, um, reminding people that, they, that walking actually is a form of transport and not just the tiny bit at the end of the journey or the beginning of the journey, but actually could be the whole journey or the journey from the mainline station and, and over a lot longer distances. But it was also actually a way 
of um, talking to people and to councils and to authorities about the infrastructure changes that are needed. And I've got two images here, actually. And these were from a, um, an audit we did with some really supportive council officers in Camden a long way back. I don't know how long ago this, this was now. It seems forever ago before COVID. But we were walking a, a parallel route to the Euston Road, which is a, one, a great route that we've got. That's kind of a parallel route south of it. Um, and we stood for quite a long time on this junction here on the left, where you see these poor students kind of darting between the traffic. We stood there because we were auditing this route, just watching that bit of infrastructure there and just how appalling it was for people walking and how long these students were stood there while this flow of traffic was just funneling through, not stopping really at all. And they were waiting and waiting and waiting. The massive wide side road junction, a huge wait of a, a, a huge distance to cross. I don't think, I think, I'm not even sure there was a drop curb actually on one side. And on the other side, there is, Houston Road, straight outside Houston Station, the mainline station, the first welcome many visitors are getting or people commuting into London. They get to London as a great big road without even a green man to help them across. Now, I have been, I, I presented this image actually at a conference last week and um, someone from the TFR's team that's working on the HS2 did say that this is going to change. So it is changing and I know that. But I think, which is great, and we're looking forward to that, but I think it's just a good illustration of even in the kind of central London where there are huge amounts of people walking, how there are big changes that need to be made to the walking infrastructure. And of course, this, and this gets even greater when we, leave cent when we get beyond central London. So I think the aim of this projects and all London Living Streets campaigning is a kind of just a reminder that, you know, walking is actually at the top of the transport hierarchy. And I think this is, this is you know, this, this is forgotten a lot of the time. Um, that actually walking is at the top, but often it gets kind of sidelined and put down. So I think it's a reminder to, to prioritize this in decisions and that there is massive transformations that are needed and huge rebalancing of space. So I think in London Living Streets, in its manifesto pledges, which was still in, was still in kind of still in discussion, but we're kind of calling for a massive reduction in motor traffic, and this does include road pricing and does include ULES car. And let's be bold, like cities like Oslo and Paris that are going car free. They're being a lot bolder with the language they're using and and the tools that they're using, and taking gradually taking huge amounts of car parking space out of city centres. And also no new roads, um, but we can bring on, I'm sure that will come up in the questions <laughs> later. Um, and transforming streets, obviously low traffic neighborhoods are a great part of that. The high streets, as we were just talking about, have got to be a focus and the school streets as Will was talking about earlier. Obviously walking routes, I've said a lot about, and I think walking routes, I think the regeneration, I think if you build walking routes into regeneration schemes from the outset, you're, you're putting, you're embedding walking there um, for, from the beginning, I think this is crucial. And then finally, and I, and I know Will's already spoken about this, but this is absolutely critical, is you've got to end pedestrian death, 20 mile per hour speed limit. Um, and this is a big one. And it's more than this, because actually there's a lot more work as the great work that Mike Grant, colleague at London Living Streets is doing on crossings. But, but as a starter, a green man on all arms of a signalized crossing really, should be an absolute priority in London. Um, I have no idea how long I've been speaking to, but I'm gonna I'm gonna almost finish, and I have no, I, I, it might be too long to I don't know, but please get in touch with us because I think I think growing networks beyond growing walking networks beyond London is our what is our next goal. Printing more maps and getting this being just being talked about in central London is going to continue. And I think this is vital because I think this is a really good tool for welcoming people back into the centre safely post-COVID and accessing museums and families getting off stations, walking to museums on foot, I think is going to be the way London comes out of this. So this is a very, this is a vital tool for the centre. There's lots more to be done in outer and in London. So get in touch if you'd like to get involved. And, and please do email me if you want a free map. I will send you one in the post tomorrow. Thanks very much.